Hi, my name is Larry Rizzolo. Thank you for joining our discussion about a pressing problem facing Guilford today. Guilford boasts a robust town center with a small New England feel and rural areas with lakes, a golf course, woods, and open spaces. There is ready access to larger stores and amenities along Route 1, and we would like to maintain these qualities. Zoning regulations are an essential part of achieving that goal. At the same time, Guilford is an expensive place to live. Like the rest of Connecticut, there is a severe housing, sh housing shortage. Rents and housing prices continue to skyrocket. One in three Guilford residents are considered cost burden. That is, they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. 70% of our town workers, including police, fire, teachers, town government workers, the staff of local businesses, find it find affordability here is a challenge. Accordingly, many do not live in town. So it might be better to call affordable housing, workforce housing. More than 700 workforce units need to be built in Guilford to meet state targets for affordable housing. And to bring housing costs down overall, we need to increase housing options at all price levels. We're here to discuss how Guilford can grow uh, to make it affordable in an environmentally friendly way that maintains our quality of life, along with the quality of our wetlands and open spaces. This is an ideal time for you to make your voices heard. After many years, Guilford is updating its planning and zoning regulations. Soon the proposal will be released, followed by a 35 day comment period and one or more town meetings. All of you are invited to comment. Today, We'd like to tell you about the revisions, the process to adoption, and how you can get involved. With me are Jamie Stein, the town planner, Scott Edmond, chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and Sandy Ruoff, the leader of the Housing Committee and a member of the Board of Selectmen. Jamie, uh, let's begin with you. Uh, tell us about your role and uh, an overview of how your office serves uh, Guilford. Great, thank you, Larry. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity. Uh, my name is Jamie Stein. I'm the town planner for Guilford. I direct our planning and zoning department. So there are basically two tools uh, in, our, in our camp in this department. One is the plan of conservation and development, which is a long-term strategic plan. Uh, we do it every 10 years or so, um, in which we chart the course for both development and conservation of land. Um, the second tool in our toolbox are the zoning regulations. Zoning regulations are basically how the town um, dictates, put it a little hardly, but also mildly, uh, how we direct and govern uh, private property and the uses along private property. So zoning helps us understand where certain uses can take place within town. Uh, and as Larry said, those zoning regulations have been undergoing a process of a comprehensive rewrite and revision for about the last three years. So really in a nutshell, the uh, town's planning and zoning department helps uh, direct, steer, and enforce uh, land use and development in town. Thank you. Uh, Scott, given the role of the planning office, why does the town need a planning and zoning commission? Hi, again, Scott, I'm in, uh, chairman of the planning and zoning commission. So the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission is, is actually part of the zoning regu regulations. As Jamie mentioned, um, there's state um, there are state statutes uh, involved with zoning rights, and then each um, town is allowed to adopt their own their own zoning regulations. And as part of having our own zoning re regulations, um, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, helps out with with question. So within the zoning regs. Um, there leaves some some questions involved. Um, you can't every regulation can't uh, think through every possible scenario. Um, and so what the zoning commission is a, is a group of volunteers that try to do the best we can to represent the town um, and the town's um, uh, priorities when it comes to making decisions about uh, special permits. Or, or subdivisions, um, that sort of thing. We we work hand in hand with the zoning uh, planning planning and zoning office, um, 
and we uh, you know make sure make sure that the public is heard make sure that your neighbors um, if you're trying to do something with your land make sure that your neighbors are uh, informed um, and make sure that they can can come and have you know their opinion heard yeah so my understanding is uh, uh, the commission is all made up of uh, volunteers correct yeah, every volunteers. Day okay so uh and thank you for your service, uh, volunteering your time. So, Jamie, uh, the bulk of the proposed regulations are are not new. They're clarifying and simplifying regulations. Okay. Now that you have a 300-page document in electronic form, you've simplified ways to navigate the document. But in addition, uh, the regulations incorporate some modern uh, zoning concepts and adapt to new state laws. Uh, please tell us about these exciting developments. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple that will be very new for Guilford. Uh, one specifically is the uh, concept of a planned development district. So in the past, the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission has struggled when an applicant or a land landowner wants to transition certain allowable uses uh, that are tied to the zone in which their property is, is placed. So for example, in Guilford, there was a history of only being able to do uh, multifamily housing on commercial land, so in our commercial zones. So if you owned a parcel that was residentially zoned and you were looking to do uh, higher density multifamily housing, you would have to do kind of a two-step process. You'd have to change the zone through a map amendment that goes before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And then you'd have to, if that were successful, come forward with a land use application, usually a special permit uh, or site plan for multifamily housing. Uh, and so plan development district is an opportunity in the new regs to kind of couple that uh, and only have one application. And we also see it when you get, for example, a mixed use development that might be doing retail, commercial, maybe a portion of industrial, maybe a portion of residential. These are kind of exciting new mixed use uh, proposals that towns are seeing. And so Guilford and its new regulations will have an opportunity to kind of couple um, that map amendment, text amendment, and then site plan or site plan proposal, development proposal. Another great thing that we've added to the regulations uh, is accessory dwelling units as of right. So Guilford has a long history, uh, over 12 years, of allowing accessory dwelling units, which is basically any private residential property that has a primary single family dwelling can add either attached to their home or detached a structure for another dwelling unit. And so we have now made that an as of right action. And that's something that um, we considered during the adoption of our affordable housing plan last summer. It was also part of uh, Public Act 21-29 from the state legislature, you know, moving to create kind of easier infill density of a diversity of housing units. So accessory dwelling units are now as of right. Um, so, uh, oh, can you sure. define what, what do we mean by as of right? Sure, great, thanks Larry. So as of right basically means that now you as a property owner can take out a building permit, uh, which is tied to a zoning permit, and you no longer have to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission to get a special permit approval for an accessory dwelling unit. So we're taking a step out of the process, and the step that's coming out of that process is going before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now, you still have to meet your setbacks and your bulk standards and all the basic zoning things that you would do with any as-of-right development. For example, if you own a residential parcel or a residentially zoned parcel in town, you have the right to build your private dwelling unit, your home there. And the land use commissions, the Planning and Zoning Commission or the Zoning Board of Appeals, don't really get involved in that. So we've transitioned accessory dwelling units into that sphere as well. So I imagine that makes it a little less costly. Yeah, for sure. And a little less timely. Uh, and I think we were able to make that transition more easily than other towns because we did have basically 12 years of experience where the Planning and Zoning Commission was seeing accessory dwelling unit applications that, you know, over 95% of them were approved. They were, you know, um, People who were getting on in age and needed supplemental income to support staying in their home. They were 
uh, young families who needed supplemental income to stay in their mortgage, or they were growing families that needed a caretaker or a, a grandparent to come in uh, and, and live with them. So a lot of really great uses uh, that we saw for accessory dwelling units and therefore uh, made that transition. Uh, the other thing that I'll say uh, is electric vehicle charging stations. This is a new provision that we have in our regulations, uh, also kind of dovetailing with a new um, uh, piece of state legislation uh, in which any new development, either housing or commercial, that has more than 30 parking spaces associated with it will have to have a provision for electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, and so that's now a new part of our zoning regulations. And then lastly, what I'll say uh, is that there are currently provisions for affordable housing. This is a new um, sort of effort that Guilford is doing. Um, there are density bonuses that are offered for private developments, uh, multifamily developments that do set aside a certain number of units for affordable housing. And uh, there was a new provision, I think, for conservation zoning. Is that right? Uh, we're calling it a conservation development. Uh, it's a bit of a mix between um, what is currently on the books as an open space subdivision regulation and also what I would refer to as a planned residential development. So the idea of clustered, a little bit higher density housing with smaller lot sizes than a conventional subdivision. Uh, so you're sort of saving space for roads and utilities and the footprint of each house. And then 50% or more of the parcel is dedicated to open space. So that's what we're calling the conservation development. Great, thank you. And now, uh, Sandy, uh, I'd like to turn a little bit to the affordable housing. Uh, your committee has nurtured the development of affordable housing near the train station, and that's soon to break uh, ground, but it's taken eight years. Can you tell us about some of the hurdles for developing affordable housing in Guilford? Well, um, there were specific hurdles for this particular site, and then there are, are hurdles um, in general relating to the fact that we um, don't have um, sewers and um, uh, we also um, don't have um, city water throughout most of the town. But in particular for the Woodruff property, we um, identified that property after getting two state grants that were centered around finding locations um, near either a bus line or a train line. And we ultimately picked the Woodruff property. The town owned the land, uh, which was helpful. And there was a town meeting in February of 2020 where we, um, the voters um, allowed the selectmen to uh, offer the land um, at, at no cost to the not-for-profit developer NeighborWorks New Horizons um, for developing the uh, apartments that will be um, built there. Um, COVID slowed down. Part of the reason the eight years has uh, happened is that COVID slowed down um, all the uh, processes that have to happen. And um, the uh, neighbor, the not-for-profit developer needs to get um, funds from the state and other sources to build this project. Um, ultimately, there will be rent paid and um, there will be even some uh, tax money coming back to the town. But in order to get the uh, project off the ground, there had to be some some funding. And um, I, we're getting much closer to that funding now. And there was also, uh, we we have to go through, um, I, I don't like to call them hurdles, but there's, there's like um, lots of rules relating to state rules through the uh, DEEP. And also then um, rules in our town with the Inland Wetland Commission and Planning and Zoning Commission. And so far, I believe um, we are going to be able to be successful with the regulations and still accomplish what we're trying to do. But it's going to be at best um, a, a 16 unit um, development when it's done. And I think it will be very in keeping with the neighborhood and um, it will be lovely, but it's only going to really be a drop in the bucket um, in the percentage that we would hope to achieve in Guilford for um, affordable housing units. Great, thank you. So Scott and Jamie, you heard Sandy talk about some of the challenges in uh, fostering uh, affordable housing. 
uh, what other challenges face the development of, of uh, affordable housing? Uh, Scott, uh, why don't we begin with you? Yeah, I, I think it's clear and in, in, uh, I, I know part of Sandy's committee uh, was an exploratory to find out, you know, what's needed in this town. And I know, Larry, you said kind of in, in the jump um, that it's become pretty clear that there's a need in town. So there's certainly a desire and a need, um, but some of the hurdles, like Sandy mentioned, is is simply just, um, you know, the septic system is one of the one of the uh, parts of a lot that it limits the amount of, of housing that can be on a certain lot. And also it uh, is a significant amount of uh, money for the septic system. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times that's the part that really makes the development um, that really tells you how much you can fit on a lot. Um, and, and that's going to be your limit in a lot of cases. Now, that's part of the reason why uh, Jamie mentioned there's some um, some opportunities within zoning um, to uh, increased densities in different ways uh, to allow for some of these projects to be a little bit more um, viable uh, when you're because a lot of times it just comes down to economics um, it comes down to you know the cost per unit um, and and if you're trying to make a certain percentage of the units affordable um, then that that money still needs to come from somewhere uh, whether if it's state funding as Sandy mentioned um, it can take a long time to get state or federal funding. Um, so a lot of times we're trying to find ways to incentivize private investors and private developers um, to really want to um, work hand in hand with the town um, <clears throat> to make some of the units affordable and also make it a, you know, make it a, a positive project for them as well. They, you know, they still need to, um, it needs to be a good project for them. It needs to make, you know, they need to make money off it as well. Um, so that's, that's the the back and forth, the balance that we're trying to strike here um, with the new regulations, um, as well as all these different options that Jamie laid out. Yeah. Jamie, you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, as Sandy pointed out, uh, the route of, that the town has taken with the Woodruff affordable housing development has been a bit of a long road, uh, but it is something that the town is committed to doing more of in future. So the notion of land acquisition and having the land uh, to be able to do a development on is, is one that is challenging, um, but the town is committed to doing that. And I think that also, uh, as Scott alluded to, you know, septic, drinking water, these are all unique to Guilford uh, and other towns within our region. Uh, site development challenges. Um, and I think some of the changes in the zoning regulations have been at creating those opportunities for higher density multifamily housing in not just commercial zones, but also residential zones. So that is a change that we are moving towards in the regulations. So offering more opportunities to do multifamily development all throughout town. Um, the second sort of you know, challenge would be just in our um, existing land uses. You know, we're a very land rich town in that we have sort of, you know, four acre zoning in North Guilford down to 10,000 square feet zoning or lot sizes, forgive me for the jargon, um, you know, along the shoreline. So we have a great diversity of land uses in town and trying to come up with a regulation or an approach to affordable housing that fits all of those is challenging. Um, you know, one of the ideas that we're contemplating this notion of inclusionary zoning is trying to harness the efficiency of the private development market to create affordable units. Um, and so as a development uh, proceeds within town, if we can get affordable units um, as a set aside of that development, uh, we'll be able to increase our um, deed restricted affordable housing units in that manner. Now, Sandy had mentioned that um, uh, there was money for grant money for building along a train lump at the train station or along a bus line. Uh, in the state legislature today, there are several bills being considered uh, that, again, focus on development around train stations and bus lines. Uh, what's the rationale behind doing that? Well, just to uh, clear that up, the grant money was for studies to identify appropriate um, 
sites for affordable housing, but they had to be, the state wanted them to be near a bus line or um, a train line. So the grant money at that point that the town got was two $25,000 grants to conduct the studies and hire um, consultants to help us make a choice. So that was, um, and I honestly, um, I guess the assumption is, is that um, people um, um, in affordable housing may or may not have vehicles, but um, that was not something that came from the town. It came from the state. Yeah, I, I've always felt that the, the typically the stipulation is is to make, you know, the state slash and as as a, you know, along the same lines, the town puts in a lot of money to our infrastructure. Um, a lot of money goes into bus systems. A lot of money goes into train systems. And so I think uh, that's probably why, in general, the state wants to incentivize those items. There is something to, to be said for, for as Sandy mentioned, um, once you get to a certain level of affordable housing, um, then there's a question of whether uh, those residents are able to afford a car. But uh, a lot of times when we're talking about workforce housing, um, we're we're talking about people that have cars, um, and so that's that's why when we're looking at this specifically for Guilford, um, we're not necessarily just talking about um, those corridors that the state talks about in their funding. Um, we're talking about a lot of the town in general because again, workforce housing. You're talking about eighty percent of the area medium income, as opposed to um, to lower percentages, and therefore those folks have um, means to get around. Um, they're just looking for a more affordable place to stay in town as opposed to having to go to a town that's 20, 30 or more minutes away. Yeah, because there are people working in Guilford now who would qualify for the um, definition of the income requirements who are driving to Guilford from other places because they can't afford um, a reasonable rent. So I guess the benefit would be uh... Uh, not eliminating car use, but reducing uh, car use. Uh, and that would be a good thing overall, uh, especially if you can walk to, we have so many nice shops in downtown uh, Guilford. Um, right. Being oh, yeah, absolutely. There's benefits to, to, to having these developments more on Route 1 and more towards those corridors, because again, you're um we're using more we're, our, our bus system is more effective our train system is more effective and also just getting people to walk around is always something that we're trying to promote as a town the safe city uh, the safe streets uh task force has been hard at work trying to um add sidewalks where where they're needed so that we can uh, encourage folks to walk around more safely um so there's, that's another priority that the town's had jamie we haven't had much time to talk about uh commercial uh zoning um, maybe you could say a few words about uh, what's new there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great kind of segue from our discussion about walkable areas. So the notion that you could basically meet the majority of your needs within walking distance is a, kind of an urban design and, and uh, downtown planning scheme that's been around for a long time. And I think, um, you know, as we start to approach commercial zoning uh, that allows for a mixed use development, so retail, commercial, manufacturing, residential, we start to kind of create more and more walkable spaces. Uh, and I think one of the things that you'll see in the zoning regulations is that we went from something like 22 different commercial zones, and we have consolidated them into about 11. And there was a particular interest paid to not losing any uses. We didn't, didn't really lose any allowed uses. We just tried to consolidate and give some um, consistency uh, to what we were allowing in our commercial zones, how uses were permitted and what uses were permitted. Uh, and I think there's a real emphasis on the Route 1 corridor because, I mean, as identified in our affordable housing plan, the Route 1 corridor not only has regular bus service, it's mostly out of the floodplain and the coastal area management boundary, uh, and it has public water. So a lot of the infrastructure uh, that would support higher density housing and as well as a bit of a mixed use community. Now, Route 1 from end to end has quite a bit of planning to go through in order to create that kind of feel, you know, if we could aim to, to have pockets of Route 1, if you will, that have 
kind of a different uh, sensitivity to them, but still allow for that mixed use development. And I think the zoning regulations and the consolidation of the commercial zones, particularly along Route 1, are the first step in then working towards uh, receiving funding and doing an analysis of the full Route 1 corridor and trying to you know, understand how we plan both in our plan of conservation and development, but also in our perhaps a comprehensive master plan for Route 1 uh, to accommodate all of those activities in a way that feels walkable and true to the Guildford. Wonderful. And now we, we get to how these regulations are adopted. I mentioned at the outset that there would be a 35-day comment period followed by uh, one or more town meetings as necessary. And is this... Uh, just by a, a vote of, of the people that show up? Or, or Sandy, uh, is there a role of the Board of Selectmen in uh, approving the new regulations? Um, I'll defer to Jamie on this. I don't believe that the five Selectmen approve these without town input. I Does it go to a town meeting, Jamie? Uh, no, so the, the Planning and Zoning Commission has the vote here. Um, okay, so the planning and zoning yep. commission. Okay. Yep, it's the planning and zoning commission. Now I'm sure we could find some clause there that if something should go awry and we can't come to a resolution, which I really don't expect. I mean, part of our um, efforts in this three-year process have been really, you know, working with all the commissioners. I was at one time a planning and zoning commissioner when we first started on this effort. Um, you know, and and making sure that uh, we've been engaging the public and you know, explaining the work that we're doing, but essentially the Planning and Zoning Commission will vote to adopt the regulations in full. Now, we do have uh, certain reviews that take place. So the Regional Planning Commission uh, this Thursday will receive the full draft uh, of our zoning regulations and they will have an opportunity to comment. Uh, DEEP, uh, our Environmental Regulatory State Entity, has already been looking at the regulations and they too will have an opportunity to comment. Uh, all of the public, all of our committees and task forces and commissions will also have an opportunity to comment. And as Larry said, uh, that 35 day public comment period will culminate in one or more uh, public hearings uh, in which the commission will, will hear that feedback and, and respond to that feedback. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, oh. I got confused. I knew the public was involved somehow. So it's the public hearings that right. um, will give people opportunities to question, comment, or whatever. But um, you're right, the final actual uh, formal adoption is through uh, P&Z. And those public hearings will be during our regularly scheduled public uh, planning and zoning meetings, which are the first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, so I think we're... With the 35 day, then we're targeting uh, the May meetings. Is that correct? Jamie? Yeah, the second meeting in May will be the first public hearing. So that is May 17th. Yep. Okay. And uh, and perhaps they'll be uh, in person in the community center, or do you think they'll be on Zoom? You know, Larry, it's a great question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in a hopefully post pandemic age, uh, the virtual meeting has really stuck. Um, but it is something that I would like to discuss with the commission at one of our upcoming meetings to see if there is an interest to hold it uh, virtually, you know, via the Zoom platform or um, try to do it in person. Um, last year for about, I don't know, six to eight months, I did sort of a hybrid meeting uh, at the Manunkatunk room in the community center. And more often than not, uh, I was the only person sitting in that room. So, you know, we, we have the capability through the great investments of the town to be able to do both in person, Zoom, or a, a hybrid. Okay. So do uh, does anyone have any closing thoughts? Um, I think from, from my perspective, uh, related to the Planning and Zoning Commission, again, we're volunteers. We're here to uh, support the community. We're here to... Um, you know, look out for the best interests of the entire town. So the best way for us to do that is if you, uh, if you, you know, send in your comments, uh, if you can review 
uh, the regulations, Jamie here can can mention real quickly how that's going to be available uh, for you to find. Um, review the you know review the review the regs. Leave us your comments, and then um, certainly feel free to log in uh, to one of our meetings um, and you know voice your opinion, ask questions. Certainly, we we can answer as many questions as possible. Um, but we're looking for as much info you know as much as your input as possible. Um, and then as far as affordable housing goes, um, I, I think. The, as we said, there's a there's a kind of a groundswell of people of interest in this town that seems to be increasing. And um, if you have an interest in that, uh, you can also speak to me or, or Jamie or, or Sandy about how you can get involved. Right. I was going to say we have um, the committee that formed in 2015 has kind of a long name, and it's called the Housing for Econ Economic Development Plan Committee. We hope at some point to move that into a permanent commission and make the name less a little more less shorter and more direct and um if anyone has interest in that committee they can um reach out to me um i believe all my information is on the town website as a member of the board of selectmen yeah and i'll just say yeah. larry if i could i just want to thank you for your time and your efforts and sort of adding to this conversation and then bringing it to a wider audience. You know, I think one of the most remarkable things about Guilford is that we have such an engaged populace that volunteers their time to really kind of bring everybody together around subjects. And I wanna thank you for that time and effort that you've put into this. Uh, and also offer anyone, come visit us here at Town Hall South, 50 Boston Street, and ask your questions about the zoning regulations. We can have a conversation, and I'm happy to walk you through any part of those regs. We understand that it's daunting to look at 300 pages, but you know, please do know that a lot of intent and a lot of activity and thought have gone into creating these, and we welcome uh, any comments and feedback that you have. And Jamie, did you yeah, want to say I something about the website? of how people can view things and comment? Sure, yeah. So I've been working with our public information specialist within the First Selectman's office. Uh, we will be on the town calendar. We will be on the front page of the website. We will be on the Planning and Zoning Commission's Agenda Center. We'll be on the Planning and Zoning Commission's webpage. Uh, we're also creating uh, through an interesting web-based platform that the town has called uh, Zen City Engage a space where all of the public comments that we receive will be uploaded digitally and the public will have access to uh, that, that page off of our main website. And then you will also be able to sign up for notifications through that spot. So if anything changes to that page, you'll get an email. So we're hoping uh, that all of this will, will help make this a, a, a highly uh, engaging uh, activity moving forward. Great, and I would like to thank uh, everyone in the audience for attending. I hope you will tell your friends. Uh, this uh, video will be on uh, uh, Guilford Community Television. It'll be linked on the uh, website that uh, Jamie just mentioned. And I hope you'll get all your friends involved in guiding the growth of our town. Thank you. <laughs>